Good evening, everyone. Caleb and Daniel have, Caleb and, excuse me, Brandon. We're in Daniel, and Daniel just prayed. But Caleb and Brandon have a gold sheet that may be of assistance to you, not only tonight, but over the next several weeks as we work through Daniel chapter 11. Um, there's a father and son preaching family. Last names are the Halls. And I know at one time they, they were preaching in Texas, Katy, Texas. And um, anyway, they have a lot of 39, 40 lessons on the book of Daniel. And this is a sheet they put together. It's from the, <coughs> excuse me, it's from the revised standard version. So it may be a little weird to read that version. It may be uncommon or unfamiliar to you. But um, it, it's as thorough of a job as I've seen to get on one page all the different rulers and some locations that are mentioned throughout the course of Daniel chapter 11. I'll put most of those names that are on there on the screen when we get to those sections, but that may be a good sheet to stick in your Bible for the next several weeks, or if you read these at home, to have just nearby, and uh, that can help you help, you help us uh, through this text, okay? Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Caleb. Anybody need one still? Everyone have one? Okay, so chapters 10 through 12 are one of the most pulling back the curtain moments that we have really in all of Scripture. That Daniel, this longtime servant of the Lord in exile, 70 years, nearing the end of his life, he's fervently praying and mourning to the degree that he's fasting even, and an angel, a messenger, comes to him, and he tells them a vision, and the vision humbles Daniel, and over and over again, even physically affecting him. And the angel restores his strength multiple times. And the angel even says, here's some of what was going on. I was held up in Persia for three weeks by evil angels, as we kind of summarized it. So then when you get to chapter 11, we see the dream itself. Okay? And we'll, the one thing we'll keep coming back to, and we'll mention it again tonight, is chapter 10 to verse 14 is a crucial verse to understanding chapters 11 and 12. Because there, the angel says, this is about your people, the fate of, the future of your people. One thing, just to kind of tie some of this together and follow up on Hugh's question last week about angels, what are they doing today? Uh, Hebrews is probably the best place for trying to get a grasp on today. Post-Christ, post-resurrection, the beginning of the book of Hebrews, are they not all angels? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. That's their role. That's been their role. That sounds as though that's still their role. But the back side of that book in chapter 13 and verse 2, unaware seems to be the key word. That we, we're not going to have moments any longer like Daniel had. That even in the Old Testament, they were, they didn't happen all the time where God says, here is an angel. It seems as though there are specific turning points in history. Here with Daniel, with Mary and Joseph, and Zechariah and Elizabeth, obviously, in the time of John the Baptist and, and Christ's birth. But unaware seems to be the dominating word for us to remember today. We don't know how God accomplishes all the things that he accomplishes. But we still have to understand that angels, ministering spirits, serve a role and a function for his greater purposes. And we need to thank him for that while not placing our hope in those. Instead, as the book of Hebrews certainly would remind us to do, we place our hope and our endurance in the Son, in Christ. All right, so in chapter 11, there's about 150 total prophecies, give or take a few. And they are so accurate that skeptics don't even try to argue that they are inaccurate. They instead say, well, this must have been written, say, 100 B.C. or 50 B.C., they ignore and reject the possibility that Daniel could have written these things in the 530s B.C. and say it must have been written after they all happened. So we see what case the skeptics are making for its accuracy. If those who reject the inspiration of Scripture would look at Daniel chapter 11 and say, you know, there's no way this could have been written ahead of time. It's got to be written 
as a recording of history after it happened, do we see they're, they're acknowledging and they are validating its accuracy already. You won't find a single liberal scholar of any stripe who will nitpick chapter 11 and say, uh, you know, they're really kind of wrong about this king and that king and this detail and that detail. So already we know just from the opposition, these things are accurate. Other factors lead us to know this is inspired. This was given to Daniel 500 years, 400 years before they ever happened. So we need to thank God for these specific things that he gives us. Back to the book of Hebrews. This is one of the ways that God did speak to the people. Okay, verse 1, key verse, long ago at many times. This is one of those many times and in many ways. This is one of the many ways through prophecy, through the giving of dreams to Daniel. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but just as important of a verse, verse 2, in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir to all things, through whom he also created the world. So no matter how powerful and wonderful the angels were, they weren't God's Son. He's, the angels are not the heir of all things. Angels didn't create the world. In fact, they were created by Jesus, by the Son, by God. And so as powerful and as wonderful as this chapter is, it's not a formula for us today to know the will of God. Instead, we go through Christ, through the Son. And we need that reminder, and we need to be thankful that God has once and for all spoken through his Son. All right, what's the value of this? When we get through a study of chapter 11 and chapter 11 and 12 especially, what can we look back and say, well, that was helpful. This was valuable. This was relevant because it moves us to see the overwhelming case for the inspiration of all Scripture. Because we can see that God spoke to Daniel in 530-ish B.C. about events that would happen three, four hundred years afterward. We can know that everything God says in Scripture is true and inspired. So what then God says through his son, what God says through his son about salvation, about the church, and everything that he desires today is inspired because of the overwhelming case of inspiration and because, in part, because of these fulfilled prophecies. But number two, we need to remember that God has always given his people hope. The specific reason God gives this dream to Daniel is to give Daniel hope. Remember, he's mourning, he's desperate, he's hopeless, potentially. And... Because Daniel records it. Daniel's about to die. But as Daniel records it, he's going to pass it down and preserve it for the children of Israel who would come after him. And it's dreams and visions like this that would sustain them up until the time that Jesus came. So how valuable was this vision, not just to Daniel, not just for us to come back and say, oh, wow, look at these fulfilled prophecies. It was specifically helpful to the Jews as they lived through some of these things. And they wondered, what's going to happen? By the time we get to the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12, we're going to see God's plan unfolding for the fullness of time for Christ to come into the world. So this sustains the people of God, gives them hope, even when circumstances would suggest otherwise. Um, one, one reminder, quickly, um, when we find out or we, we run into questions we have about these prophecies, really good advice anytime, but especially this chapter and the end of the chapter and chapter 12, this is not the time to go to Google and just type in what does Daniel 11 or Daniel 12 mean or go to YouTube and say what does Daniel 11 or Daniel 12 mean, Okay. Because there is a wide, wide ranging set of opinions, interpretations, and as you could suspect, the majority of them are misleading and are inaccurate. We need to be sure that we're going back to the text and we're putting it alongside history and we allow it to speak for itself. So just a quick reminder uh, there. And one, all right, one final question. We know the truth of Romans 8, 28, that God's always working things together for good, which means in the likeness of his, of his son, verse 29. But how do we know that? Paul says you should know this already. He's not just saying, here's this new fact. God works things out for his purposes. No, he's reminding us of something we should have already known. 
So even though we don't know how God's always doing it, how do we know that God does that? Because of passages like this, that he says, here's prophecy, and then we can look back in history and see it fulfilled. Because we can look back through Scripture and always see that God has always used any set of circumstances to bring his will into being, to bring his son into the world. This is an example of the case that we can build in our minds through Scripture. That God has this pattern of always working things for his greater purposes in the lives of his people. Okay, key verse 10, verse 14. The angel says he came to Daniel to make you understand, to make Daniel understand what is to happen to your people. That was Daniel's heartache. What's going to happen to my people? And you can understand Daniel's heartache when you remember he's approaching the end of his life. He's concerned. What's going to happen when I die? Here I am in Babylon. A lot of them are now back in Jerusalem. Uh, but, but what's going to happen? Not just what's going to happen because of the nations around them, but what's going to happen because of their proven pattern of rebellion and unfaithfulness. So the angel says, here's what's going to happen. It's going to happen at some time in the future. Okay, let's read together verses 2 through 4 to set us up. Daniel chapter 11, verse 2. And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia. Okay, so Daniel's already in the Persian Empire under the reign of Cyrus. So three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he is arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity or his lineage, his heritage, nor according to the authority with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up to go to others besides. Okay, so this section of three verses, two, three, and four, covers quite a bit of history on the timeline. We see four kings of Persia mentioned. These are the four that follow Cyrus, okay? Cambyses, Bardia, which was an imposter, really, uh, Darius the first, and then Xerxes. Xerxes might be familiar to us because he also went by Ahasuerus, who is the king of Persia in Esther. If you want to go to Esther chapter 1, you could see all the riches of Xerxes or Ahasuerus. And that would obviously be consistent with what's said of him in verse 2. A fourth shall be far richer than all of them. As an empire... Really, you could probably argue Persia was at its height under Cyrus. But certainly after Cyrus, the greatest king with greatest success, greatest riches, was Xerxes. Okay, there's going to be, I think, uh, nine more kings that follow Xerxes, but they, it's all downhill from there. Because here's what happens historically. Xerxes amasses, amasses all of these riches, and he begins to get, get a little arrogant. And he's hearing about these city-states over in Greece, and he decides to go try to capture them. And although he has greater forces and greater wealth, he's turned away by them. He doesn't conquer them. Nor do they really conquer Persia, but they sustain themselves. They remain this group of city-states in Greece. So he comes back to Persia defeated. All right? And it's all downhill from there. So what that means is Greece, because he did not defeat them, Greece is allowed to sustain itself, and over this period of 150 years, eventually Alexander the Great comes along, and at about age 19, begins to take over militarily, and he, he, he unites the entire known world under the reign of the Greek Empire. So just to illustrate kind of what's happening here, um, you know, you go back 50-ish years, you know, we had especially notably the war with Vietnam. We had some standoffs with Russia over communism. Like it's, now it's not too much of a stretch, unfortunately, if we were to be told, um, you know, back in the 70s we were worried that if we didn't do anything in Vietnam, communism might take over the world. We, that was the fear, right? Well, it, we didn't really win over there, 
But then, for the decades that followed, we thought, well, communism is not going to take over the world. But now, 2021, what do you think? Would you be surprised if we heard that a communist country takes over the entire world? Wouldn't be a surprise, would it, because of China, right? So if we were kind of telling United States history like the angel is telling Daniel, this kind of history, we would say, yeah, United States, pretty big power, won World War II, defeated some evil forces. Other evil forces tried to rise in the decades that followed, but you know, Johnson, Nixon, came up short in Vietnam, and then mighty king in China arose and took over the world. Even though it's decades later, because it was a turning point that opened the door for something to happen down the line, we just gloss over and fast forward through decades of history. You wouldn't necessarily have to go through and list every president after Nixon. And so what's happening here is Xerxes is the one who unprovoked went after, and I'm not making a political statement about communism or Vietnam, I'm just illustrating, right? We get that. He went unprovoked to Athens, unsuccessful, but that probably motivated Athens a little more, and it allowed them to remain in such a state that eventually one of their great ones took over and eventually took out Persia, okay? So, verse 3, the mighty king, is Alexander the Great. So that means that in between verses 2 and 3, you've got the change over of a kingdom, and Alexander the Great is the guy who is in charge. He's responsible for that. You never have a politically powerful king or politically powerful era in Persia after Xerxes. So that fast-forwarding happens, and it happens for a reason. But then, verse 4, as soon as he is, has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided. Well, what happens to Alexander the Great? He takes over about 19. Anybody know what age Alexander the Great died at? Either 32 or 33. He was only this massive leader for about 13 years, and as soon as he had amassed this massive kingdom, boom, he dies. He doesn't have an heir, or his heir doesn't take over. And his kingdom is divided among his, his four generals. And so that's what verse 4 shows us happens. So what we've done in these three verses is to go from Persian rule, where Daniel is at, under the rule of Cyrus, Daniel chapter 11, verse 2. And he fast forwards all the way through the end of the Persian Empire, taken over by the Greeks. And you remember that's been prophesied multiple times in the book of Daniel already. And now we're even past the most notable ruler of the entire Greek Empire, which is Alexander the Great. We're now post Alexander the Great. Now that's important for two reasons, okay? Remember when, when Paul would say, Galatians 4, in the fullness of time, God brought forth his son, born of woman. In the fullness of time, Okay, Greek culture is still dominant in the first century when Jesus is born. There's no such thing as a Greek empire any longer. The Romans have taken over. But the Greek language, the New Testament was written in, Greek arts, literature, and thinking, philosophy, is still the dominant cultural force. Hellenization is what that's called. And so these seeds were planted hundreds of years before when Xerxes... Esther's husband goes in and tries to bully Greece around. It then leads to the Hellenization of the known world and ends up being a um, big factor when Jesus comes into the world. So there are four kingdoms that are left. His generals divided up. And our main emphasis, and you'll see in chapter 11, is on two of those four. Okay? You got the Ptolemies south or in Egypt and the Seleucids, which are the north or Syria. You won't, you won't go find anywhere in chapter 11 the king of the east or the king of the west. You don't find it because the emphasis is on the north and the south. So here's Alexander the Great's expanses of his empire. So he dies in um, when he's 32 and after it's probably about um, a few decades, 20 years or so, finally the kingdoms get settled Subkingdoms, the governorships, if you will, get settled, and this is roughly what they look like. Okay. So, if we read all the way through Daniel chapter eleven, 
all 45 verses. And we only see the kingdoms of the north and the south. Why do we only see them mentioned? Is his goal an expansive, comprehensive world history? Or does he have, have a different goal? What's the goal of the vision? Chapter 10 and verse 14. What's to happen to who? To Daniel's people, the Jews. So why does he not mention the other kings? Because they do not directly impact the Jews. And you want to see how directly the north and the south impact the Jews? Look at the map. They are right up against each other, right in Judea, Jerusalem area. So their back and forth is always going to impact the Jews. Okay? If Tennessee and Florida fought, we'd be like, affected by that. So here, north, south are constantly jockeying for power. And who's caught in between? The Jews. Okay, so again, follow-up question, same as the, the, the one just before when we asked about the map. But why, why does he move so quickly? Why does he move so quickly through 150 years of Persian history? And why does he move so quickly through Alexander the Great? You're skipping over some stuff, angel. I mean, Alexander the Great, one of the best of, of all time military leaders. Why would you not spend several verses at least describing him? Because it all comes back to his people, the Jews. All right? So if you find yourself as a Jew and Alexander the Great's out there conquering everything and you get a little afraid and you look and you see, oh, well, verse 4 says as soon as he has arisen, he's broken up. I must not have anything to be afraid of of Alexander the Great because he's not coming against us. His concern is not us, the Jews. A lot's got to take place even after him. So my hope is settled in God because... He's a blip on the radar. That should remind us just of how different our view of history as a human being is compared to God's view of history when he is ruling the kingdoms of man. The details he wants us to know are not always, maybe even rarely, are the details we think are most important in any given moment. Okay. Questions through verse 4. What we've done is covered 150 years, or a little more, 170 years or so. Persian kingdom is no longer. Alexander the Great ended the Persian kingdom, expanded the Greeks, died, and the four governors took over, establishing different peoples, yet the Greek culture still dominates. So it's still technically the Greek empire, but you've got sub-kingdoms within the Greeks. Questions through verse 4. Okay, the rest of our time, let's go through and we'll read as much as we can through verse 20. And we won't, will not take the time to explain things other than just to see if we can identify who's kind of gaining the prominence. All right, you've got north and south are our two key kingdoms. So all we're going to do as we read from 5 through verse 20 is to see which one's in charge. And all this is building to chapter 11 verse 21, okay? It's a back and forth, and Antiochus the fourth, Epiphanes, which we've already talked about in chapter 8, um, really ruthless, notorious guy. It's all building to him. So 5 through 20 gets us set up to where he takes the stage in verse 21. And he's the one, especially, that God is warning the Jews about. Okay. So who wants to read for us? My right hand, left hand of the side of the auditorium. My right hand side, verses 5 and 6.
Thank you. Who, who's in charge? Who's got this upper hand as of verse 6? And again, that yellow sheet translation may be a little awkward. I, I'm not necessarily recommending you have to read that translation. It's just a good diagram, okay? That's the revised standard version, which the ESV actually comes from it in its lineage, but don't feel like you have to read that, that one. The king of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he and shall rule. Verse 6, the daughter of the king of the south shall come make the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the strength of her arm. She shall be given up, her attendants who fathered her, he who supported her in those times. Who do you think's in charge, north or south? Who's got the upper hand through verse 6? It's the north, okay? Now, it gets a little weird because um, there's a king, and we'll, I'm trying to get sidetracked too much, but the guy who ends up being the king of the north that's talked about was protected by the king of the south at first. He goes up, and he takes control, and then defeats the ones who had given him protection. So there's a lot of political intrigue, a lot of... Uh, of back and forth, a, a lot of using of women, of daughters and wives to try to gain an upper hand. Okay? So just know that the end of verse 6, the north has the upper hand. Okay? Now someone read middle section, center section, verses 7 through 9. Okay, is that one a little clearer? Who's got the upper hand after verse 9? Who's that? The south, right? Okay, so Egypt, the Ptolemies. You see it? He shall deal with them and prevail, verse 7, when he goes against the king of the north. He shall carry back to Egypt. These are from the Babylonian uh, pools of resources. He'll carry all the way back to Egypt all these precious things. For years he shall refrain from attacking the north. Verse 9, a king of the north is going to come, try to kind of maybe come take some territory, but he's pushed away. He doesn't succeed. He goes back home. So for the time being, the south, Egypt, has the upper hand. Okay? Someone to my left, your right. Verses 10 through 13. Okay, so who's in, who's in prominence now? After verse 13, what? The north. We see the pattern? I mean, it's ping pong right now. And the south tried to. It gained a lot of resources. It gained a lot of, of multitudes. And yet verse 13 makes it clear the north shall be even greater. Um... Now, someone read verses 14 through 16. We'll go back to my right-hand side, your left, 14 through 16.
I was going to break it up. If you want to keep reading, go ahead. <laughs> Someone in the middle want to read us to the end, 17 through 20. Okay, guesses as to, or are you able to keep up? Who's got the upper hand here at the end of verse 20? North or south? North, the Seleucids. South, the Ptolemies. The north, Syria. The south, Egypt. Anybody? Figure out what's going on there? It happens really in verse 15. The king of the north shall come and throw up siege works and take a well-fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not stand, or even his best troops, for there shall be no strength to stand. Yeah, that's the north, okay? So as of verse 15, the north establishes like enduring prominence, okay? They're going to squash Egypt from being the dominant power from verse 15 on. So just as you saw the Greeks take over from the Persians back in verse 3, now you see the Seleucids, the northern kingdom, finally once and for all show their strength and push the Ptolemies aside in terms of world dominance, okay? They remain a people, all right? Um, Egypt remains a thing. <laughs> but here, especially as it relates to the Holy Lands, the north is the people, is the kingdom in charge, Okay? So what's fascinating is that that happens in verse 15, but then verses 16 through 19 are about the demise of the one who put the south out of the picture. You've got a guy named Antiochus III. He's called Antiochus the Great. So he once and for all secures victory for the Seleucids over the Ptolemies. And yet, now we see the messenger quickly showing he doesn't end well. Because he's going to kind of do what Xerxes did, but this time he's going to go to Rome, and he's going to get squashed, and he's going to come back humiliated. He tries to get some tax money to send back to the Romans that he offended and, and, and attacked. And he goes to these little villages, and as he's ransacking their temples, they turn on him and kill him. So he has this terrible demise, even though he is Antiochus III or Antiochus the Great. So the north, we need to see the main point of all this is that the north is the one who has established enduring prominence, right? It's back and forth, it's ping pong, until the north once and for all is able to amass enough resources and can put the Ptolemies away. Okay, what questions do you have? Cursory reading one time through. We'll come back next week and we'll look at each section a little more in detail just to see how the action moves. Yes. Right, yeah, it's, it's still more um, colony kind of thing, yeah. Right, yeah, I can't remember exactly where, where he went, but yeah, he was trying to expand. So I, I don't know if it was, uh, you know, say Cyprus or, or, you know, Sicily, one of those islands, or if it was actually Italy itself. I, I don't know exactly geographically, but yeah. The, the seeds of the Roman Empire are already going, and he tried to. Okay. <laughs> yep. Right. Oh, yeah. Hundreds of years in advance, yep. Right. Yep. Yep. 
Right. Yep. We. That's right. Yep. It's a great point. I would challenge you before next week. I mean, it, the more we read over this, the more comfortable we get with it. And don't get distracted by every little detail. First, try to figure out as big a details as you can and just move toward the smaller details, okay? Um, but, but having a list of people on that sheet might just be a good starting place for you. And like we opened with, skeptics don't argue if it's accurate or not. They argue when it was written. So that means you can go to Wikipedia. You can go to Encyclopedia Britannica and kind of research some of these people. And um, it all fits because God gave it to us long before it ever happened. Now, I would, I would challenge you, if you can, as you read through verse 20 again, look in verse 14 and look in verse 16 and begin to see how this impacts the Jews. Begin to see how the Jews respond because from... Chapter 11, verse 2, all the way to chapter 11, verse 14, you don't see the Jews mentioned at all. Even though it's impacting them, the Jews are not mentioned until verse 14. And notice what they begin to do when history is happening around them and even to them. What do they do? So just something to chew on as we want to see. Really, that's kind of where we need to land in verse 20 before Antiochus IV comes on the scene is, is how are the Jews impacted in all this. All right, final questions, comments? All right, thank you for what you've contributed. Thank you for reading. Look forward to picking back up in verse 5 next week, Lord willing.